welcome again to the applied physics and physics conference. Today we are delighted to have Professor Arun Zana to give today's program. Uh, Aaron is the Sid Richardson Foundation Meetings Chair of Professor, University of Texas at Boston. His research has focused on new or unexplained phenomena related with quantum physics of interactive electrons in material as a contributor to the series of integer and fractional quantum effects, electronics in metals, semiconductors, topological block bands, and momentum space very curvature phenomena, the correlated electron hole fluids and excitons, polar atoms, condensate, and two dimensional materials. It's a long list where he has made a mark here. Uh, Alan has a lot of awards. Let me list the other one. He's the Canadian, the Canadian Association Physicist Third Third World Medal in 1987. The Oliver Buckley Prize of 2007 for his contribution of the quantum core physics, and also the Wolf Prize for the recent progress and the prediction of the Mori phenomenon, which was found by the MIT group. He is also a member of the American Association of Arts and Sciences and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. With all those honors, what I find the thing which resonates totally with me and like it all will be the thing he put on on his own website. I now have been working on a series for condensed matter for more than 30 years. More than 30 years. <laughs> okay, maybe 40 years. I still wake up in the morning anticipating the pressure and credibility to spending my day thinking about new possibilities for the unexpected and unknown behavior in condensed matter, and are working with interesting young people in finding their research directions. So with that, um, thank you, Zia. Uh, it's my, my pleasure to visit here in this uh, semi-COVID world. Hopefully it will be a completely non-COVID world soon. Uh, this talk is, as uh, ZX was suggesting, is about materials physics. And uh, materials physics for a long time was uh, uh, really uh, centered at Bell Telephone Laboratories, but uh, since the 1980s, it's uh, really its heart and soul is a number of strong programs at universities around the world, uh, including uh, uh, the program here. and. For that reason, I'm, I'm very lucky to have a chance to, uh, to visit uh, this really uh, now global center for materials uh, theory. So materials theory is a branch of science, a branch of physics, where we exactly know what the rules are. It's just quantum mechanics and Coulomb interactions, the same as we learned in high school. Uh, except um, that when instead of having uh, a single atom, just practicing, <laughs> uh, uh, like here, uh, uh, in, a, in, in a condensed matter, in a crystal, uh, uh, which is um, mostly what condensed matter physics is about, we have <coughs> um, complex phenomena, complex phenomena that we know typically emerges from uh, interactions between uh, degrees of freedom, even if those degrees of freedom independently be, behave simply, and even if they interact with each other in some way that's simple to characterize, the behavior can quickly become uh, very complicated. And uh, this is actually the cover page of the uh, uh, 2010 uh, decadal sur survey. It's always interesting to look at these surveys uh, at the end of the decade that they were anticipating. And you can see uh, this is a list of things that they thought would be important activities in, in materials and condensed matter theory in, in uh, the decade. They definitely got some of them right. There's nothing here about topological materials uh, or about entanglement. Uh, so they didn't get everything right, uh, but they got a lot of things right. 
and um, yep. <laughs> yes. Let me say that they also said that if our predictions were right, we will be extremely surprised and disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you know, uh, that's very much to the point. The delightful thing about materials theory is that it's full of surprises uh, that occur regularly. Uh, God decides uh, what happens in condensed matter systems, and that's wonderfully uh, democratic and uh, for the subject and speaking as a theorist, it also teaches humility, which is very, very healthy. Uh, and um, okay, so what my topic today uh, can be grouped under what was anticipated in the nano world that really has to do with uh, uh, what emerged from work that was going on at that time in nanoelectronics, and in particular, uh, in the study of 2D materials that I'll get to in just a second. But uh, my subject of my talk, which is more what I'm going to call more materials, uh, had its 15 minutes of uh, fame several years ago, thanks to a really surprising and marvelous experimental discovery by Pablo Carrillo Herrero's group at MIT, that I'll uh, talk about uh, <clears throat> a lot in my talk, and uh, the perhaps uh, principal observation is uh, summarized here, which uh, shows, uh, first of all, as a function of density uh, in the 10 to the 12th range, that uh, the properties of the two-dimensional material under study uh, change a lot, and uh, this range of densities is important because uh, the, uh, this behavior, as I'll explain, occurs in artificial crystals or a material that have a lattice constant on the 10 nanometer scale. And that large lattice constant makes it possible to change the number of electrons per period, the number of electrons per atom, if you like. Uh, by numbers bigger than one, and that's the scale on which properties change. So you can easily measure how properties change, uh, and it's a function of the number of electrons per atom. And in this particular experiment, uh, what was observed is with very small changes in density, these are actually changes in density uh, in, as I'll explain, in graphene uh, bilayers, which are changing the number of electrons per carbon atom by a part of 10 to the four or so. And the physical properties have changed a lot. So this is the main subject uh, of this talk. And now I see you've gotten this stuck. Let's see if I can unstick. Okay, unstuck. Okay, so uh, let me uh, explain more about more materials. Um, and before I really get started, uh, uh, let me acknowledge uh, my collaborators when I started working on this uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, Rafi Bistritzer, who's now at, uh, works for Applied Materials in Tel Aviv, and Feng Chen Wu, who is a graduate student at UT Austin and is now at uh, Wuhan University. And also the people, including uh, Chun Li Wen, who's sitting right here, uh, who are, uh, as uh, ZX was saying, entertaining me every day with trying to keep up with the, uh, uh, with the active experimental work in this area and all of the mysteries that it creates, and also, uh, also the funding agency. Okay, so more. Uh, so more actually, uh, according to Wikipedia, which is as deep as my scholarship goes, the, the origin of the word more uh, is connected with uh, textured materials, and uh, it has the same root as uh, as uh, the wool of uh, uh, mohair wool, uh, and. Um, uh, uh, ventured back and forth between English and French, and, and uh, uh, finally uh, accumulated an accent. And uh, <clears throat> so, more materials uh, are common in textile physics, common in uh, uh, various branches of science, for example, electron 
uh, microscopy. Uh, and we're interested here in a particular type of moray material, um, a moray pattern, I should say. Moray patterns made from two-dimensional crystals. Uh, this is an illustration taken uh, really from a vision that was, uh, was articulated in the Nobel Prize uh, lectures of, uh, of Andre Geim and Kostya Novoselov, who pioneered two-dimensional materials by successfully uh, uh, starting the uh, work which uh, you know, led to development of techniques to successfully isolate two-dimensional crystals, single layers uh, of material, uh, and study electronic and optical properties. And uh, now, then they, by this time, uh, they were starting to think about combining uh, bunches of two-dimensional materials, stacking them on top of each other uh, in a kind of uh, a Lego, game of Lego, uh, combining different materials. And already, uh, when this decadal survey was conducted 10 years ago, there were uh, <clears throat> some experiments, uh, uh, pioneering experiments by Eva Andre, uh, in particular, starting to look at uh, the way uh, uh, the degree of freedom of twisting two layers relative to and of each other, and how that affected electronic properties. So what I'm showing you now is actually uh, two layers of uh, two honeycomb lattices. You can only see one because they're right on top of each other. And uh, the moray pattern uh, has to do with twisting. You see there, I've twisted one layer relative to the other. A very similar uh, uh, effect happens if the two lattices have slightly different lattice constants. Uh, but let's stick with this case. And so you can think of two graphene layers twisted by some small angle. And you can see in this uh, uh, open regions of the pattern labeled AA here uh, that form a triangular lattice that the stacking arrangement between the layers varies periodically in space when you uh, when you do uh, a twist uh, uh, there's a triangular lattice of local AA stacking uh, and you can identify with each with uh, within each unit cell regions where you have BA stacking of the two layers and AB stacking. So AA stacking refers to uh, the layers, the uh, atoms of the two honeycombs all being right on top of each other, and BA and AB to having uh, only half of the uh, atoms in the honeycomb having a, uh, uh, a neighbor in the other layer. So there's a very clear uh, visual pattern here. Uh, the smaller the twist angle, or uh, this uh, plot here allows for a difference in lattice constant, the strain if you like. Uh, the smaller, <coughs> but, uh, smaller the twist angle, uh, if there's no difference in lattice constant, uh, the, uh, the more a period just goes like one over the twist angle, and, and you can, in principle, can get any lattice constant for this periodic pattern from zero to infinity. Uh, so what's become clear uh, by now is that this is this uh, this method of making artificial lattices is surprisingly successful in really generating uh, uh, systems that are sufficiently periodic over a long enough length scale that they really behave like solids behave like real crystals. Okay, so I want to make a uh, distinction now, and um, uh, a distinction uh, uh, for which I will reserve the word more a material, and that is uh, uh, the case in which the starting material uh, are semiconductors or semiconductors. And uh, what I mean by that is that the uh, low energy states, the states close to the Fermi level, the states whose, electro, uh, whose uh, behavior determines most electronic properties, are all close together in momentum space. 
It, uh, this is actually the electronic structure, as most of you probably recognize, of a single sheet of graphene, uh, two-dimensional electronic structure, uh, the two-dimensional momentum space of the crystal is finite because of uh, bright scattering off the periodic potential. And it turns out the low energy states are in two corners of this uh, finite area momentum space, so-called Bruen zone. Uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, near those two corners, uh, they're always close together uh, at low energies. The region of momentum that is accessible is uh, or, uh, at low energies is finite, and that means uh, if you interfere, uh, you know, electronic waves from uh, one of these packets, they have nearly the same wave vector. Their interference pattern uh, has to have a long length scale, and uh, they can only resolve for this reason. They can only resolve structure. Uh, on long length scales, and that's important uh, because uh, uh, when you take two crystals and twist them relative to each other, generally speaking, they're not strictly speaking a crystal. But if you only see the Moray pattern, then they behave like a perfectly periodic system, and that's how you get artificial two-dimensional crystals. If you started with a metal, you'd end up with a quasi-crystal. And uh, <clears throat> uh, okay. So uh, by overlaying two-dimensional crystals that have slightly different lattice constants or, or that are twisted relative to each other, you get artificial two-dimensional periodic systems. And we haven't yet fully explored what kinds of two-dimensional crystal models we can realize using this trick, if you like. Uh, but we have a couple of samples, and what's uh, the range of phenomena that's been seen uh, has been uh, surprisingly rich. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is just emphasizing the point I mentioned before. It's important that the lattice constants are long, and the typical number is around 10 nanometers, because uh, there's a limit on how many electrons you can move in and out of the 2D system with electrical gates. That limit, you're going to talk to David about it. Maybe it's uh, it, it's 10 to the 14 per square centimeter if you're a hero. Uh, if you're only semi heroic, maybe 10 to the 13. Uh, but uh, uh, people who know how to do these things, which doesn't include me, uh, routinely change the electron density by 10 to the 13, and that's uh, per square centimeter, and that means that in these Moray periods, they can change the number of electrons per atom by, let's say, something of order 10. Uh, per, when I say per atom, per effective atom of these artificial crystals. And that's kind of enough to go across a row of a periodic table. And uh, it, exactly what periodic tables I'm talking about, I'll, I'll talk more about. So this is uh, what you actually see here is uh, data from the group of uh, Andre Young. It's uh, color scale uh, resistance versus magnetic field. It shows some important properties. For example, experts can read off of this that uh, over much of the range of filling factor, these uh, uh, systems of electrons in these crystals actually behave like a Fermi liquid, uh, which is, of course, common in metals. Also, uh, and um, uh, but um, uh, behavior changes with filling factor. For example, this blue shaded region with small resistance is actually clearly established uh, as superconductivity by now. Uh, <clears throat> so. Now let's talk about uh, how to think about the types of uh, artificial crystals you can get. And here I'm going to talk about what is not the first example realized experimentally, uh, but um, the simplest uh, example. And uh, it's simplest because if you make two layers of the two-dimensional semiconductors that uh, Professor Heinz over here is uh, 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 was a pioneer in studying, 
the semiconductor physics of single layer transition metal dihydrocarbonides like tungsten disulfide and molybdenum disulfide. It turns out that if you uh, <coughs> put two, these two layers together, then uh, it's known that the uh, low energy uh, missing states, uh, this is the gap in the semiconductor over here that separates, that's supposed to be energy vertically and uh, the two layers horizontally, and the white areas represent the gaps between the occupied uh, valence band and empty conduction band of the semiconductor. And so if you remove a few electrons from the valence band, if you make a few holes, you can see that they're energetically preferred to be in the tungsten by an energy amount, which is a few tenths of an electron volt, and that's a large energy as far as what I'm, I'm talking about is concerned. So that means that holes exist uh, in the tungsten disolenide material. And we know that there's basically uh, two states for every momentum. And uh, now I'm slipping into uh, semiconductor physics jargon uh, by measuring momentum relative to the Bruin zone corner when I, when I say those words. But there's basically uh, uh, two states for each momentum at the top of the conduction band, uh, one in each bit. Okay, so it's just uh, the system has momentum degree of freedom and the spin degree of freedom at the top of the valence band. And uh, so those statements are uh, for, uh, you know, for crystalline tungsten disolenide on molybdenum disolenide. If you have a more pattern, then what happens is that the local stacking the, uh, arrangement between uh, the two uh, single layer semiconductors is varying slowly in space, and that moves the top of the valence band up and down. So this system is described by a model with a, a periodic potential that has the periodicity of the valence band for uh, some effective mass electrons that have, uh, that have a spin degree of freedom. In other words, this is more or less exactly a, a Hubbard model. And uh, uh, so uh, this is um, uh, idea was proposed in a paper with uh, Feng Chen Wu a number of years ago. And uh, you know, if you calculate the uh, energies, energy bands, how energy depends on momentum in these artificial crystals, uh, this is. Uh, energy as a function of momentum uh, with non-standard labels, uh, not in the Bruen zone, not in the momentum space core of the, of the crystal, but the momentum space that's defined by the Moray pattern. Okay? So this is a very large unit cell, a very small momentum space, but everything max, and uh, uh, there's one flat band, uh, and uh, just and, and electrons in this band can be described by uh, a simplest possible model of strongly interacting electrons, which is a one band Hubbard model. Uh, and uh, so that, uh, that idea uh, has now been successfully explored by many, uh, many experimental groups. I think these papers from 2020 are the uh, are the uh, first experiments. Uh, the figure on the right shows actually a measurement of the spin polarization versus magnetic fields uh, uh, in these artificial crystals. Uh, and um, uh, the spin polarization is actually measured optically. I won't uh, uh, describe exactly how it's done, but uh, but uh, a lot of the way these are explored are uh, based on uh, understanding that had been developed uh, by uh, Professor Hines and uh, uh, his group over the years and many other groups, very detailed understanding of uh, optical properties of these systems. Uh, and this is basically some sort of magnetic circular dichroism, what you actually see here, maybe a little bit in this early experiment for uh, 
what was called half filling. So that's where you expect uh, one electron on every line of sight. And uh, those of you who know upper metals physics know that there, you expect an insulating state there if interactions are strong. And here you can see at a half, they're starting to see uh, more or less uh, Curie-Weiss localized electron type uh, response to a magnetic field, whereas in other filling factors, what they see is more metallic-like. Uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, there are many, many uh, properties of these artificial crystals that uh, you know people have so far have only been able to uh, skim the surface. This is one of the interesting things that was uh, discovered experimentally by a number of groups. I actually don't know uh, who saw this first. This figure is from the uh, work of the Kinfai Mott group uh, and uh, Jishan group at Cornell University. And uh, <coughs> uh, it's a measurement uh, for these uh, artificial hover model systems as a function of, this is actually different units here, along the x-axis here, this is the number of electrons per period of the crystal, and uh, the a black line is basically a capacitive measurement of the uh, uh, thermodynamic density of states of the system, and basically the peaks measure where charge gaps occur uh, in the system, where there's a gap for charged excitations, this is the uh, mod insulator state, one electron per period. Uh, but you can see that there are gaps uh, at many other filling factors. Some of these states are actually uh, uh, strike states, like are seen in cuprates. Uh, the blue lines show that uh, similar properties can be measured uh, optically. I won't uh, 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 discuss that in detail. Uh, but um, so far, most of these experiments discovered uh, 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 studying Hubbard model uh, systems, Moray materials, Hubbard model Moray materials, uh, have been looking at systems in which the bands are extremely narrow. So they're really uh, <clears throat> they're really closer to the uh, classical. Uh, um, or lattice gas limit for electrons confined to lattice site uh, um, than they are to the metallic limit of, uh, in which the um, bands are very, let's say, very broad. Uh, and uh, uh, so these, uh, uh, these, these states can be thought of as more or less classical states with a small quantum perturbation, and therefore people uh, normally describe them as bigger crystals. But uh, these are probably, uh, <clears throat> would appear in many strongly correlated systems, uh, except that there's too much disorder. So really this is another demonstration of the possibility of varying in these artificial systems, the number of electrons per atom without doping and the, uh, the uh, you know, the uh, chemical disorder that goes along with that. Uh, okay, <clears throat> uh, so this is, uh, you know, so uh, the Hubbard model system is maybe a simple model of interacting electrons in two dimensions or three dimensions. These experimental systems, of course, are two dimensional. But that doesn't mean its properties are easy to understand. Even though there's only one band, and uh, that doesn't necessarily may mean that it's easier to understand the properties. Perhaps it's even stronger, uh, even harder. But there are a number of fundamental things that we uh, want to understand, uh, uh, can hope that we can understand. These are actually triangular lattice hover models that these ex experiments are being done. Uh, this experiment actually is in situ tuning across a metal insulator transition, uh, changing the bandwidth, the ratio of the uh, uh, bandwidth to the interaction strength uh, um, uh, to go from the, uh, you know, the band limit uh, <coughs> uh, in which you have, uh, clearly have a metal and a Fermi surface and so on. 
to the insulating limit where the electrons get stuck on lattice bonds. And uh, so this uh, type of phase transition is definitely extremely interesting. And maybe we have a new opportunity to uh, understand it or to study it experimentally in a new way. It's probably true that, uh, for example, this type of uh, data resistance as a function of temperature for uh, a bunch of systems on either side of the metal insulator transition uh, looks a lot like uh, data that's been taken in other systems. Uh, and it's probably true that disorder is still playing uh, a, a quite a big role uh, in this data, but um, uh, yeah, the derivative is uh, clear in terms of having a greater ability to uh, all the time to control the amount of disorder in the material. Let me just mention uh, uh, briefly, uh, uh, this is another uh, possibility uh, that has not been realized experimentally so far, as, as far as I'm aware. This is 2D semiconductor layers uh, uh, stacked uh, so that they're close to uh, being stacked right on top of each other. Uh, it turns out that in uh, that case, the low energy states are like in bulk materials, the low energy states in the valence band are near the center of the uh, microscopic through enzyme, not near the edges. And, uh, uh, and that when you make a bilayer, uh, you know, uh, of uh, two identical materials, uh, it forms bonding and anti-bonding states, and it acts basically in the end like a single layer. And importantly, a single layer where the effective potential has honeycomb lattice symmetry uh, instead of triangular lattice symmetry. And honeycomb lattice, we know, is very different because it has, it's bipartite, uh, 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 like the square lattice. Uh, it can be divided into two sublattices. Uh, where uh, neighbors are always in the other sublattice, and that, as you know, has a big effect on magnetic properties. And maybe uh, if magnetism uh, is related to superconductivity, and if Hubbard models are related to Cooper 8 superconductors, uh, these <coughs> honeycomb lattice systems will be uh, really an ideal system to, uh, to test some of the ideas that have grown up around uh, Cooper 8 superconductivity simply by doing an experiment. This should be, I believe, enough Steve can predict, uh, will a, a hover model, 2D hover model be a superconductor? Okay, so, uh, and all ranges of interaction should be accessible. And uh, uh, there's actually, you know, uh, Sometimes properties depend on details of the band structure, like T prime over T types of things. So there, not every detail that might be important is tunable, but certainly interaction strength should be tunable over the entire range and of course doping. Uh, so uh, the honeycomb lattice system uh, also, uh, you know, in the, maybe in the more metallic regime is interesting as kind of an artificial graphene. And uh, that's another reason that uh, <clears throat> this could be interesting uh, to do these systems. And uh, you can also realize that higher energies have any lattice system. So I think I meant uh, I should skip these points, uh, uh, which had to do with the fact that, you, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> these moray materials are not, uh, the most important qualitative difference between moray materials and real uh, atomic lattices is that the uh, potential that attracts electrons to the lattice sites is weaker. It's not an uh, infinite depth attractive Coulomb interaction. It's just a periodic potential that has a minimum somewhere and uh, that has consequences. Okay, <clears throat> so um, um, so let me uh, uh, talk, I'll uh, spend most of the rest of uh, the time talking about twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, that's the other moray material on which uh, uh, the most experimental study has been done so far. And we can just follow our uh, 
usual recipe for understanding what the effect of Hamiltonian of the system looks like. Uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, energy as a function of momentum in the microscopic Gruen zone of the thermodynamically stable stacking arrangement of two layers of graphene, which is actually the AB stacking arrangement. I'm highlighting the low energy states, which occur uh, at momentum near the Rouen zone corner. You can, uh, uh, when I showed you this for graphene previously, uh, you may have noticed or known that there are two states because of the two sub lattices of the honeycomb lattice. Uh, and so if you have two layers, then there actually are four states uh, that are uh, close together in energy. These states are uh, uh, split by tunneling between the two layers. So when you have a graphene bilayer, and this is very well understood and known from, uh, from the properties of uh, graphite, through both three-dimensional graphite and stacking faults and graphite and so on, that uh, uh, you know, that uh, the main way in which uh, 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 carbon layers, honeycomb carbon, honeycomb lattice carbon layers influence each other is from electrons hopping back between, uh, back and forth between the two layers. And this is the, uh, if you like, uh, the, uh, those uh, uh, interlayer couplings produce this pattern of level repulsion of the low energy states at zero momentum uh, in bilayer graphene. So, if I have a more A pattern, uh, then uh, <clears throat> this way in which the states split uh, with position uh, will vary with position in the Moray pattern. The interlayer tunneling Hamiltonian varies in a very well understood uh, uh, way with the stacking arrangement. And so uh, a simple model of twisted bilayer graphene uh, uh, can be uh, derived in this way. Uh, this picture is from a paper uh, written, uh, wrote with Rafi Bistritzer on this topic a long time ago. And what it's showing is just one complex number, which is a tunneling amplitude from some particular sub lattice, let's say the B sub lattice of the bottom layer to the A sub lattice of the top layer. And uh, so it's a complex number represented as a little arrow with a length and a direction. And uh, uh, um, it, uh, the arrows get small, means the tunneling goes to zero at certain points in the stacking arrangement, which you kind of uh, know by symmetries, for example. And uh, the uh, red points here are the AA point stacking arrangements that I, uh, that I discussed uh, earlier. Uh, and uh, so each of the element of the two by two interlayer tunneling uh, matrix element has a natural position dependence like this. And everything is characterized in the simplest approximation by a single number, which is the strength of this interlayer tunneling. And uh, so when we uh, were looking at two layers of graphene that are coupled in this way with Rafi Bistritzer, this is uh, sublattice dependent interlayer tunneling written in a certain way here, but all it's saying is that the interlayer tunneling has a periodic spatial pattern. And uh, when the twist angle is uh, large and the moray period is small, that, uh, <coughs> that tunneling uh, Hamiltonian is uh, varying rapidly in space at large twist angles, and therefore it couples together electron states in the two layers that have very different momentum. And one thing we know about graphene layers is that they have very large dispersion. The energy of an electronic state changes very rapidly with momentum. And therefore, at large twist angles, uh, <coughs> their uh, two layers are almost invisible to each other. And they become more and more strongly coupled to each other as the twist angle gets smaller 
and the more a pattern changes more slowly in space. And uh, it was, uh, uh, it's not surprising perhaps that the velocity of the electrons in the graphene sheet slows down uh, as the layers get more strongly coupled to each other. And what we discovered in this uh, work numerically is that there is a, a magic twist angle, actually a discrete series of magic twist angle at which the velocity of an electron at the Fermi level, the graphene crosses through zero. And if you look at the average velocity in these uh, uh, energy versus momentum in the, uh, you know, in the mini band Bruat zone, it's smaller than in a single graphene sheet by a factor of about uh, 10 to the three to 10 to the four, okay? Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is actually our uh, original estimate of the electronic structure. We didn't expect this property, but we uh, observed it. And uh, you notice that there's flat bands. I'm actually going to emphasize that there are eight flat bands here. Uh, and uh, but uh, th there are also other bands, which some people call dispersive bands. Let me just call them remote bands. That's what I usually call them. But you can see in our original calculation, they're not that spectrally isolated. Uh, it's fortunate that if you do a better theory, actually uh, uh, these, uh, this uh, point in momentum space at which the uh, flat bands are not spectrally isolated disappears. They're spectrally isolated pretty well at all momentum. So you have an isolated flat band containing eight electrons per more eight period with practically no electron velocity. And we know when that happens, all of the physics is going to be dominated by electron-electron interactions between electrons that are constrained to lie in this Hilbert space, very much like uh, Landau level physics. And this is actually uh, <coughs> the system uh, in which uh, Pablo Barrio Herrero made the observation uh, I showed you before. And uh, he and others, including uh, my colleague uh, at UT Austin, Emmanuel Tutu, uh, uh, made steady progress uh, over the years uh, uh, on actually being able to lay one graphing sheet on top of another with a controlled twist angle. And uh, that is uh, a uh, you know, necessary step to see this physics that uh, progress is still being made, including uh, progress here at Stanford and probably by uh, some of you who are uh, working on uh, doing this better, but, uh, <coughs> okay. Um, yeah, uh, so, uh, <coughs> Uh, so I have time to say uh, a few words about the electronic properties of twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, I mentioned that uh, you know there are four uh, bands kind of close in energy. Uh, each of those bands actually has a spin quantum number attached to it and a valley quantum number. So there are uh, uh, <coughs> uh, there is a fourfold flavor generalized spin slash valley degeneracy. And uh, in addition to having these uh, uh, bands associated with the bilayer, and uh, one of the properties that uh, is seen experimentally uh, all over the phase diagram of magic, twisted, magic angle twisted bilayer graphene is that you get a kind of ferromagnetism you get uh, broken symmetries of the spin and valley degrees of freedom uh, without, in most cases, it seems, without breaking uh, translational symmetry. So I call that a uh, generalized form of ferromagnetism. One of the types of observations that uh, sees it most obviously is this measurement of Hall density. This is uh, uh, electron density, size of the Fermi surface measured uh, by measuring the Hall effect. Uh, what you see at the beginning, starting from neutrality, is you make holes in the flat valence band. You start to get a bigger and bigger hole-like Fermi surface. This is uh, Hall density as measured by the Hall effect, uh, um, uh, expressed as a filling factor. Uh, so 
So that's just what you expect. And here, and then you get this unexpected feature in which the uh, uh, size of the whole light, the Fermi surface remains whole light, but its size resets to zero. And uh, <clears throat> uh, what we think is going on there uh, is uh, uh, indicated by this cartoon that instead of having uh, four flavors that you're emptying, you, in this broken symmetry state, you completely empty two of the four flavors. That's uh, in the broken symmetry, some kind of strong ferromagnetism. And then you, uh, what you're seeing is the remaining flavors empty. And uh, when I prepared this slide, I showed this actually in my seminar talk last week, uh, saying that there, uh, uh, there are claims in literature of similar things in cuprate high temperature superconductors. Uh, Steve says he doesn't uh, entirely believe uh, this data in the cuprates, but uh, <clears throat> Uh, okay, so let me just um, uh, emphasize that uh, uh, the observation I just made uh, with this cartoon focusing on the case of integer filling factor. Uh, this is filling factor uh, minus two, uh, so half empty valence bands is this way of counting. I said that what happens is that two of the four flavors are completely empty. And if the filling factor is exactly minus two, that leaves the uh, two remaining flavors uh, as half empty, neutral, if you like. And in that case, it's easy to uh, create a gap by actually uh, breaking uh, uh, an inversion symmetry uh, in the system. And that's how the insulating states are understood. And, uh, uh, here is another example of this generalized ferromagnetism. Uh, this was discovered experimentally in David Goldhaber's Gordon, Gordon's group here at uh, Stanford by Aaron Sharp and co-workers. I think this uh, data that you're actually looking at is a, uh, a follow-up experiment, data from follow-up experiment by Andre Young. But uh, <clears throat> this is at zero magnetic field, uh, uh, scanning magnetic field back and forth. And this is at filling factor three instead of minus two. So it's again another insulating state. And uh, what is measured is that the Hall resistivity is quantized in the absence of a magnetic field. Quantum anomalous Hall effect. Uh, very small uh, resistance. And uh, <clears throat> um, so, uh, this measurement uh, in partly reflects uh, uh, topology uh, 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 of these valley projective bands. They usually have non-zero term numbers that they basically inherit from the uh, from the Dirac electron starting point, uh, the Dirac electron model of the two layers that combine together. I think I, I don't have time to uh, explain this slide. But uh, even graphene and even uh, AB Bernal bilayer graphene without a Mori pattern, their valley projective bands uh, uh, tend to have uh, non-zero turn numbers as well. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and there are perhaps some experimental manifestations of that, but because of uh, forming these Mori bands, you can get much stronger manifestations uh, at, uh, in the in the Moray super lattice. So this is a cartoon of the electronic structure for the uh, quantum anomalous Hall effect observation. Uh, an insulating state at filling factor three. Uh, three of the four flavors have completely filled bands. Uh, one flavor is neutral. Uh, you can put the Fermi level in the gap, and these bands tend to be topological, have non-zero turn numbers. And uh, as we learned from David Fallis, and uh, you know, one of the most charming things uh, that I ever learned in physics that uh, you know that um, uh, a topological index of two-dimensional bands is actually not only observable but the easiest possible thing to observe in a two-dimensional electron system. Uh, uh, God was kind to us on that one. And, uh, and uh, here we see 
that uh, uh, time reversal symmetry is broken. So this quantum Hall effect of physics and broken time reversal occurs even without a magnetic field. Uh, and <clears throat> um, so th now there are two, actually two examples we have of quantum anomalous Hall effect. Uh, there is uh, one example, uh, first predicted by theorists here at Stanford, that a uh, thin film of a topological insulator, uh, topological insulators, as most of you know, have topologically protected direct home surface states on their top and bottom. And if you gap those direct cones by making the system magnetic uh, and make the magnetism on the two surfaces parallel, then the direct cone of the top surface and bottom surface will together uh, come together and give you a uh, uh, two half quantized Hall effect, or uh, <clears throat> therefore a quantum anomalous Hall effect that uh, is, uh, you know, uh, is uh, the first exam experimental example of a quantum anomalous Hall effect that now in work here is, you know, established to an accuracy of 10 to the 6 or so. Uh, uh, what's going on in these uh, twisted bilayers is different, and it's indicated by the cartoon on the right. Uh, there are two different valleys, two regions of momentum space. Uh, <clears throat> one of those regions in the uh, breaking time reversal, uh, both the valence band and the conduction band uh, have been completely filled. They both have churn numbers. Uh, but uh, opposite churn numbers, so they don't contribute anomalous Hall effect. Instead, instead the anomalous Hall effect comes from the other valley, uh, and only the other valley is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, contributes a Hall conductivity, and it has two Dirac cones, one Dirac cone contributed by each valley, and so that's the nature of that quantum anomalous Hall state. And uh, so ZX, how much time do I have? I should stop or? Okay. Uh, let me just mention this. Um, um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll skip through, uh, I'll make a couple of points quickly. These are kind of, the first one is just kind of an amusement. Uh, this quantum anomalous Hall state is, uh, uh, doesn't break translational symmetry, breaks time reversal symmetry. We can call it a magnet, but it's an unusual magnet. And uh, one thing that's unusual about it is that we know from the theory of the quantum Hall effect and from the correspondence between a bulk and edge that there, uh, 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 and th this actually goes back to uh, observations about the quantum Hall effect first made by Bob Laughlin, that there are edge states uh, and uh, uh, those edge states, even in equilibrium, uh, are circulating around the system, and they uh, produce a magnetization. If you change the chemical potential a little bit uh, in, uh, in the middle of the gap of this insulator, because there are always edge states, uh, those edge, the magnetization can change. And it turns out that the size of this magnetization, which uh, is just proportional, you know, jump, the magnetization jump from uh, uh, gating uh, this insulator so that it's weak from weakly n-dope to weakly p-dope, uh, is just uh, fundamental constants times the energy gap. And this can be easily be big enough to change the sign of the magnetization. The magnetization is not orbitally dominated, and you can change the sign of it just by going from weakly n-dope to weakly p-dope, and this has been seen experimentally. I won't uh, describe this in detail, but just trust me that the red uh, and blue regions are showing that the uh, <clears throat> that when you in this experiment when you move the Fermi level uh, across. Uh, the, um, density at which the charge gap occurs, which is about uh, 2.75 in this experiment, the magnetization changes sign. That certainly doesn't happen with spin-based magnetism. So that's kind of a curious property of orbital magnetism. 
And uh, let me, this is my last, uh, last uh, point. I just want to make this qualitative. And this is related to uh, work of Chun Li Wang, who's here, and you can uh, discuss it with him if you're interested. Uh, <coughs> um, uh, what I've written here, you know, there's a connection that's well known, uh, uh, maybe hard to make rigorous, uh, between magnetism and superconductivity. Uh, and <coughs> it's related to the fact that uh, just at first order, uh, the scattering between like spin particles in a metal is weaker than the scattering between opposite spin particles uh, because of exchange interactions which prevent like spin particles from getting close together. And so if you look at that at high order in perturbation theory, uh, it turns out that this difference can be strong enough to make the effective scattering amplitude between like spins attractive. That tends to happen this uh, when you get close to ferromagnetism and the effective interaction between opposite spins becomes very strongly repulsive. And so this uh, uh, relationship between being close to magnetism uh, and superconductivity is thought to explain the fact that, uh, you know, the 4D transition elements, many of them, if you plugged in, you know, normal ideas about electron phonon interactions should be superconductors but they're not, and it's blamed on magnetism because uh, uh, they are merely ferromagnetic. And uh, <coughs> uh, uh, similarly, uh, uh, the uh, P wave superconductivity of, uh, of uh, helium-3 is qualitatively thought to be associated with being close to magnetic instability. So uh, what is the translation of those kinds of ideas to quantum Hall systems, and can it explain some of the trends of superconductivity? Uh, so I want to, uh, I've talked about, uh, uh, so you know, in making the translation, uh, we have not only spin, but we have other spin, spin-like things as well. We have spin and valley, and then we have uh, the two bands, which uh, we can view as some kind of orbital degree of freedom. And um, let me see. Uh, and uh, 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 you know, without going through the details, uh, uh, there is reason to think that the superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphene always pairs electrons from opposite valleys, because uh, in, within the same valley you break time reversal, the energy of K is actually not exactly the same as the energy of minus K. Uh, so if you assume that you always pair electrons in uh, opposite valleys, uh, um, uh, as, uh, you know, valley uh, singlet interactions, then uh, being close to a valley polarization instability, which is common at, we thought to be close to those uh, instabilities at every odd filling factor. That's bad for superconductivity. And, uh, <coughs> um, uh, whoops. Okay. And, uh, <coughs> not working anymore. Okay, it's telling me to stop. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, this combined with the fact that the density of states goes to zero at filling factor minus two is at least a way of interpreting the superconducting domes that appear in these systems and, uh, and fits with quite a number of experimental trends. But we'll see, uh, and Chudley will agree with me here, uh, we'll, we'll wait and see whether this turns out to be uh, the true story uh, or not. Okay, so I'm going to leave you uh, with maybe uh, this slide which says that I talked to you about two more materials, and I very much hope that uh, people will succeed in making artificial crystals, starting from uh, uh, many other host to the materials. So thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh,
little opening. And you can see there's rock bottoms, you can see the water from the live kind of looking for it. Uh, from, from here? Yeah, from where the front was. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take your seat later, later on. Thank you. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, What's the Hamiltonian? <laughs> Interactions in a, in a controlled fashion. But the interactions, of course, are Coulomb interactions. And uh, uh, so we know exactly what the interaction is. Uh, uh, the interactions are constrained uh, by, um, at least if you push the other bands away to infinity, uh, by the constraint, you know, that uh, the only particles. Uh, uh, you know, the ground state is correlated by making many body states uh, out of these bands. And so it's a little bit fractional quantum Hall like. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, it's, um, um, we know a lot from experiment. Uh, we can't uh, calculate any number uh, rigorously, if you like. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm getting to your question. Are, what I'm trying to get at, Alan, is I know that. Yeah. How close can you get? How uh, close can you get? It's as far as it's not, of course, two interactions of this point of view. Funny function. There's wave functions of your band inside the large, the large unit cell are complicated because they're unmobilized. Mm -hmm. You have to get that right. Uh, to get the interaction. So, what do you How close do you have any predictive power? You know, I can say uh, uh, we're trying to check to see how much predictive power there is. Uh, uh, you know, for example, we've done ED calculations. Uh, Mike Zillatel at Berkeley has. Uh, you know, I've been doing dynamical mean field theory approximation calculations. Uh, and, but, um, you know, I'm interested in how far, what we can understand based on simple perturbative uh, ideas. And um, one thing, for example, that I didn't emphasize is uh, that there's a very clear pattern in the flavor symmetry breaking. Uh, you know, there are four different components. It's not like uh, spin, where you have spin up and spin down. Uh, you divide the charge density between four different components, and there are many ways to do that. But there's a very clear pattern in the experiment that uh, the way the system tries to make the broken symmetry flavor population such that uh, as many bands as possible are close to half filling. And I think that the reason that happens is uh, actually, uh, you know, just from the phase space for electronic correlations associated with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, correlating, mixing the two bands together. It's like half filling, if you like. So I think, uh, uh, yeah. It's like a strongly correlated, uh, you know, system that's mostly a fairly liquid, or sometimes a fairly liquid. <laughs> okay, with that, maybe let's take Steve. If you have mind, let me see whether there are students who will want to ask. This is just the usual situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, well, we went to this uh, honeycomb lattice system, 
right? That that would be a two-band Hubbard model. Uh, but uh, if we, uh, you know, uh, deal with systems which don't have symmetries, which make the symmetry like a honeycomb lattice, then uh, there is a limit where, um, you know, we can treat it as a one-band system and all of the higher energy bands we can uh, throw away or treat perturbatively as we like. Uh, uh, <clears throat> if you actually, I think if you actually occupy those higher bands, then uh, it probably is, uh, you know, uh, then describing the system in terms of a small number of type binding bands uh, don't, won't work. So, for example, I mentioned uh, in one of the slides I showed you something I was hopeful about at one time, but now I'm not hopeful about, and that is that uh, we would be able to realize Kagame lattice systems by going to a um, high number of electrons per Mori period, where the single particle bands are actually Kagame lattice bands. But I think in that limit, the electron electron interactions completely change the band structure, and uh, that kind of multi band system is probably uh, not in a reach in that system anyway. Okay, let's take another question. Yeah. Okay. And, and I'm forgetting to repeat the questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, what happens when the real atomic structure is important uh, and um, at a typical twist angle system is actually a, uh, a quasi-crystal, right, with two, uh, uh, two uh, different periods that are not commensurate with each other. Uh, you know, the original paper we wrote on this, uh, the literature, the theoretical literature at the time, people were focusing a lot on, on uh, the special properties that occur at certain commensurate twist angles. And the main, one of the main points of our paper is that those would never be observable at small twist angles. Uh, but I think if you go, you know, twist angles above 10 degrees or so, then they will start to be observable. Uh, you know, people spend a lot of time uh, trying to find interesting things in the electronic structure of quasi-crystals when real atomic quasi-crystals were first discovered. And I think that, you know, generally they just look like, uh, you know, disordered alloys or something. It wasn't really, the quasi-crystal periodicity didn't look any different than disorder. And so I think it, it might be very interesting to go to larger twist angles and, and look at uh, localization, you know, temperature dependent resistivity at low temperatures. Uh, see if you see some unusual behavior that uh, is associated with, uh, you know, almost heavy blocks that are put not quite. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, another thing I didn't mention is that uh, <clears throat> these graphene systems are always encapsulated by hexagonal boron nitride, which produces an independent Mori pattern. Uh, and so you can use that if you uh, intentionally almost align that HBN. You will have two long periods that are uh, not commensurate with each other. And that might be the most typical situation for really looking at you know, quasi crystal type systems. Um, okay, maybe I'll ask a question. In the fancy series, the obvious thing was to look at negativity, the full numbers of the graphics. Yeah. We know the interpolated graphics, graphite, uh, have been distributed along the C axis, and interpolation gives a look at negativity to get that temperature. And now we have two layers. Why is this obvious thing to never talk about? Uh, well, people do talk about it. Uh, and 
and at least it's by the final column so yeah and so the <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, I could have given you the opportunity to ask you the question. I will grant you that. <laughs> yeah, so but you know the density, uh, electron density in a turbulent graphite where superconductivity is seen is a few times ten to the fourteen per square centimeter. Still low density, you know, per unit cell, maybe 0.1 per unit cell. So this superconductivity is occurring at a density three orders of magnitude smaller. And um, uh, so it's uh, uh, it's not the same thing. Um, uh, people um, you know, uh, have tried to do calculations of uh, can uh, electron phonon interactions uh, explain superconductivity. I think the general conclusion is that they're you know, it's not strong enough to explain superconductivity uh, in this magic angle regime at, at these low densities. Uh, I think there's more, in, people are learning uh, more information about the uh, up and down phonon modes, which are, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, what happens to the flexural degree of freedom of the graphene sheets when, when it's encapsulated. Those are, I think, pretty low energy phonons. I'm not sure. I started to wonder recently if could they play a role. You know, generally it's thought that these up and down phonons don't couple to the electrons uh, near the Fermi level in the graphene sheets, which are pi electrons and therefore odd uh, under inversion symmetry. But um, yeah, I think in our real experimental examples, you don't have this inversion symmetry, so there is some coupling. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I, my counter will be too long, but I'm going to be through that this time. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you the same question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was interesting, you know, so most of the phone lines uh, had much. Uh, you know, bigger frequencies than uh, uh, than the width of the band. So it's certainly a different regime. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's not going to be important. Uh, yeah. They uh, don't have the trick of retardation to escape over the But yeah. But I mean, the point is that these things are not generally understood. And you have a narrow band that's interpreted into maybe more, far more important. Anyway, we can talk. Yeah. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.